um, and then we can invite the panel to respond, and we'll have as many rounds as we have time for. Um, can I invite you to put your hand up if you'd like to make a, 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 a comment or a question? And then, before you make that comment or question, please give your name and your institution affiliation. Okay, there's one hand here. Two, three, four. Okay, we'll have those four, and then we'll take it from there. Number one, please. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Emmanuel Rukundo, and I'm a student at I IDS. Uh, my question is more of a, a general observation on social protection <coughs> and on the current kind of trend it's taking and leave probably leaving out some things that are probably uh, suppose they're important, like health. Uh, we are looking at integrating uh, s uh, state and civil rights, probably, uh, and gender and other things into social protection programs. But uh, health, uh, social health protection doesn't seem to get uh, like a good platform of integration into all social protection programs or even having a targeted programs that really look at health and, and uh, of, of, of the people. Uh, looking at examples like Sierra Leone and probably uh, Zimbabwe or, or Northern Kenya, they are certainly ultra poor regions that uh, have very uh, enormous barriers of accessibility to health, access to health, and uh, nothing, uh, well, little is done uh, in integrating health aspects, acce access to health in social, in social protection programs taking place in these areas. Probably uh, even the biggest example that was a familiar, I once found a paper that said it wasn't really tackling health and uh, people were still spending a lot of money, a lot of the uh, uh, transfers they're getting to access health. So uh, I don't know how much the impact of those was those transfers could have on uh, households, on access to health, and how much they spend on on their other basic needs, something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Sabatis Wheeler from the Institute of Development Studies. Thank you for three great presentations. Um, I just wanted to add a few things. One builds on what Rebecca was saying. She, one of her comments was, what can we expect to achieve? Or what can we expect from cash transfers? Can we really expect them to be transformative? And I just wanted to add, what can we expect from cash transfers, particularly in emergency situations? Because that's what you were all really, you highlighted fragile or post-conflict or conflict. And I'm wondering if there's a difference there. And um, particularly um, an example that came up in the Help Age presentation, you made a distinction between the Sierra Leone case, where we really hadn't seen much change in the state-citizen relationship, whereas the HSMP case, where we thought maybe there had been. And I'm very familiar with the HSMP case, and I'm wondering, I don't actually think it was the cash transfer that caused that change. I think it was the complementary program that was a rights-based program that came in quite separately within the context of the, the cash transfer. But it was kind of like something else coming in to do with advocacy and rights. And so I'm not sure we can contribute, you know, say attribute that state society change to the, the cash transfer. And within that context, we're looking at Sierra Leone post-conflict. And some of the bullet points there were like, well, there's weak capacity, poor infrastructure. Well, of course there is. It's post-conflict, that's exactly what we would expect. So therefore, how can we expect to see a positive outcome. It's just, and it's a question for you, it's a question for the others too. Similarly, the impact of CTs on gender dynamics in emergencies. Do we want that to be a big question for us given that there's an emergency and it's a very short term thing? Maybe we do, or maybe we should wait for the, we should think about the longer term sort of frame um, that's not emergency focused when we're thinking about gender. They're just questions to think about but I think they're different, fundamentally different issues when we're thinking about an emergency versus more of a stable situation. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, next question here. Hi, I'm Paula Perez Nieto. I'm a research fellow in the Social Development Program here at ODI. Um, I just wanted to have uh, two, I mean, one is more of a comment slash question 
the other one is a question not only to the panel but maybe other experts here. Um, I think I I just wanted from sort of re research I've been involved in to highlight the the great impact of sort of contextual factors of, of many of the conclusions that are drawn from different cash transfer and other social protection programs, um, and the fact that sometimes when these are not systematized or nuanced by all the different factors that influence these sort of effects, they can be sort of uh, interpreted in many ways, uh, causing very sort of uh, different approaches in programming. So f I just, you know, from one quick example in oh, one of the quotes that Nicola was raising, uh, that there was evidence in Swaziland that cash transfers don't cause uh, intra-household violence, where there's other qualitative uh, analysis in countries like Mexico and the Oportunidades program that there has been impacts. So I think the, in terms of research, maybe one thing to to look forward to doing is um, systematizing when and in which cases and what factors contribute to impacts in one way or another, so that programming can draw on these more systematically. Um, the other issue is more of a for a question. We have talked about sort of um, the need for quantitative and qualitative data and. I think there's been lately more qualitative uh, research done on impacts on different uh, population groups and uh, and how uh, social protection and cash transfer impact them. So I wanted to know if anybody's familiar with more sort of quantitative data beyond impact um, program impact evaluation on broader community impacts. So not only on gender and children, but for example, if cash transfer have impact impacted on um, social networks or uh, positively or negatively or so. Thank you very much, Paolo. Rachel. No, it's fine. Thanks. I'm another Rachel working on social protection, this time Rachel Slater from ODI. Um, I, I, I've got two questions really that, that are linked and, and kind of follow up from what the other Rachel said and, and then what Paolo just said now. Um, a lot of the time when we start talking about social transformation or empowerment or social justice or social contracts between citizens and the state, I think we spend a lot of time assuming that that means what ha what's happening in a government-owned and a government-driven program. And I think frequently we also add to that and assume that that must be a government-financed and a government-implemented program. And I was thinking about Wally's evidence, and I know that it's only two countries and, it, and it's quite specific, but it seemed to me that what you were saying was that in a government-funded, government-delivered or implemented program, the impacts on the relationship or the social contract between citizens and the state weren't there, perhaps because it wasn't being delivered very well. But in the HSMP, where government ownership and driving of the program is questionable, you've got a contracted out arrangement where it's being delivered by NGOs and a bank, and no government financing at this point in time, we were perhaps finding some impacts on citizen and the state. And I just wondered if, you, if any of you would like to reflect on, on that. I think it kind of challenges this assumption that we have about things like social justice and social contracts all being about things that the state delivers. And I think we're we're quite sceptical or nervous about contracting things out. And I wonder whether maybe there's a challenge in what we've heard today to some of that. And then the other thing was how we're measuring this stuff. And a, a direct question for Wally, how do you measure state-society relations? What were the kinds of indicators that you were looking for in the work that you were doing? And, and perhaps some of the other people could, could respond on that. I'm part of a team that's starting to try and understand things like, well, to try and unpick whether it's true that social protection contributes to state building, social protection contributes towards a social contract, social protection contributes towards peace building, because a lot of people are saying that at the moment, and I think it's a received wisdom that's in danger of becoming a truth. But I don't think we've got any evidence, and the thing is, I don't think we know how to get the evidence. I don't think we know what, what we're looking for. So it'd be really great to hear your reflections on that. Thank you very much. Goodness me. Well, there's quite a range of questions. Um, in, in relation to the latter, um, ODI is currently working on a systematic review for DFID, trying to look at the impact of some social protection interventions on stability. And our finding so far is really that there's, there's a great lack of evidence there. So i back up Rachel's point. Okay, I won't reiterate the questions, but what I'll do is I think I'm going to reverse the order because we had some clearly aimed at Wally. So if it's all right with you, I'll give each of you in turn 
the opportunity to respond. So respond to the questions where you think um, y yeah, you're particularly interested and where you'd particularly like to, uh, to take the debate forward. Holly, may we start with you, or did I catch you on the hop there? No, it's okay. So, um, okay, I'll just start from the back as well, you know, um, with which I'll later. I think the, the indicators that, that we used, again, I mean, this is just context-specific, two case studies. In Northern Kenya, w was to look at, you know, the ability of the communities themselves to demand for services from the local authorities, right? Which means ability for collective action to take place. We assume that it actually could take place, but without the right discourse within the HSMP, that wouldn't have taken place. Because we compare that to a, a non-HSMP you know, community, which is a neighboring community, they've not been able you know, to demand for services at the local level through collective action because the space to do that didn't exist. The HSMP actually created that space. In the report, we said it clearly that it's not the cash transfer itself, right? but it's the design of a cash transfer involving a grievance mechanism through a rights discourse that made that happen. So just a clarification, not the cash itself, but the design of the cash with the grievance mechanism. Um, with C Sierra Leone, how can we expect to see changes in, in Sierra Leone? Again, I think this goes back you know, to the issue of program design. Because if you talk to top policymakers in Freetown, they are genuinely interested you know, in reducing poverty. But they don't, you know, they have the, there's, I mean, there's weak state capacity to, to actually do that. And w one of the things I explored you know, was, OK, why not just go for a universal program? So the question comes in, oh, fiscal implications. You know, we can't afford a universal program. 70% of our budget is, uh, is based on you know, do donor support. So I think as you know, players in this field, there's a challenge for us to think creatively on the middle ground. Because it's clear that you cannot do poverty targeting in that environment. You're just going to cause more problems, right? So, and again, you can't, I mean, the state is saying we don't have enough money to give every other person. So what's the middle ground? You know, that's what, we, you know, um, it, it, I think it's, a, it's part of the discussions I would like us to, to have uh, after this. Um, let me go back to Rachel again in terms of Sierra Leone's program not delivering and the hunger safety net moving. Again, back to design. You know, it's just a question of design. And as I said, the HSMP, not through the cash transfer itself, but because of you know, the inclusion of the grievance mechanism, that in itself, you know, helps to a certain limit within the program. But if it was the state, this is an assumption again, you know, if it was the state, the state will always be there. But the HSMP program funded by DFID is not going to be forever. But if it's a state-run program, which is backed by law, then that, you know, keeps it going for a very, very long period of time. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Gabby? Yeah, I'd like to follow up on this Rachel's question, if I may. Um, and also what Rebecca touched on, um, you know, should we be expecting cash transfers to do all of those things? I mean, I think the research proves that, that, that yes, there is the potential that, that, that it can, but whether it should will depend very much on, on the context that you're working in. Um, I think we need to, if, if we decide that we do want to have these, you know, additional impacts as a result of the cash, we need to be thinking about... Um, about them in the design, and that means having some sort of social analysis as well as the, you know, the market assessments and things that we do now as a matter of course. I think definitely the thing that came out of your presentation as well was the power relationships need to be um, acknowledged and, and addressed. Um, complementary actions alongside the delivery of cash. I don't think we can expect cash delivery just by itself to achieve, you know, these these more longer term objectives. And, and yes, you do need longevity as well. So. I'll come to emergency programming in a minute. Um, and I think finally, you need to be defining very clearly within your team or, or your program or with the government what you, what you mean by that objective and setting yourself milestones for how you, you know, targets for how you seek to measure your achievement of that objective because it's not going to be overnight. Um, and that will depend on the context. So, in you know, the work that we were doing, the gender empowerment trajectory for Zimbabwe for a rural woman is going to be very different from a Kenyan urban woman. So. We need to be taking those things into account mm -hmm. as well. And you asked about, you know, whether in terms of impacts of gender uh, on gender in emergencies, do we want to, to go down the route of, you know, 
trying to address these sort of structural issues or should we leave that to sort of longer longer term programs um, I think certainly a gender analysis is possible in a, in a short term pro an emergency program especially a slow onset one you know cyclical emergencies that we know are going to happen we, we can be designing them in advance the same way as we would design our other sort of emergency programs in advance um, but I think we need to decide you know, if it's more important just to get the cash out fair enough that's an efficiency perspective but in that case maybe we, we don't make these bold statements about um, or we are going to have empowerment ends because quite clearly in that sort of situation we're, we're not. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Nicola, and can I ask if, if, if you might be interested in ask, answering Emmanuel's point about the integration of health and, yeah. um, and also the point about, um, Paolo's point about um, contextual factors and empirical data. And in fact, Rachel's as well. Um, sort of along the same lines, um, about the importance of complementary programming. Um, so yes, we shouldn't expect too much from, from one program, but the very fact that there is a program, that there is a, a mechanism that's reaching people, means that there are other programs that can be added on as, as, at the same time, and also not to, not to expect too much from a program, and making sure that there are still livelihood programs that potentially are well linked up to the social protection program um, to um, to achieve the the multiple aims that we're we're asking for, and that very much goes for the the point about health. Um, some of the things that we've been exploring in Save the Children is linking health and nutrition education with um, cash transfers. Um, for example, using um, health extension workers from the PSMD. So I think those sort of discussions of complementary programming, I think, were really helpful in both those, both those points. Um, and on Paola's point, uh, basically just to, to agree um, on the importance of taking into account both the context and the program design um, in, in accounting for these, these differences. Um, and I think what the challenge is, is to work out where, and this is where you need a, a, a good body of cross-country evidence of knowing where its context and where its program design, and um, I think it's only after uh, many different impact evaluations across many different countries that you'll be able to get a better idea of answering that question. Thank you. I think you, we've got time for another round of questions. So, Nupur, Tim, yep, three, four. Okay, should we start with um, Nupur then? Sorry, mine is not a question. It's more of a reaction to what Rachel had asked earlier. So just to support what uh, Gabby is. Sorry, I'm Nupur, and I, I'm Nupur, and I work with Oxfam. Um, and we, um, Oxfam and Concern did this study together, and that's why I want to respond to this question of yours. While I take this point about uh, what can we expect from cash transfers, but um, as, as Gabby said, there are um, different kinds of disasters. There are slow onset, there are um, sudden onset, then there are the cyclical kind of disasters, and there is a potential. In many of, uh, in our experience, we've seen that we end up responding in a humanitarian um, uh, response program in the same areas with the same communities over the years. And surely, uh, in those areas, we can think of um, um, integrating gender into our programming. And cash programs tend to be a lot of uh, a large part of uh, the humanitarian response. The other um, issue related to disasters and um, um, longer-term programming is. Uh, if you look at uh, the current large-scale disasters like Pakistan and Haiti, you know, uh, these were sudden onset disasters that uh, they have happened in areas where um, may maybe agencies were not, humanitarian agencies were not present. But we've been there for a long time now. And uh, if we don't do proper programming, and these, these then become the basis for long-term development programs for many agencies. So if we, uh, and if cash transfers are a part of, a large part of the humanitarian assistance, in the early uh, phases of these programs, which then become the basis for longer term programming, or even in many cases, uh, particularly in the case of Haiti, I know that we're talking about social protection programming now mm -hmm. in Haiti. Um, if, if these programs are going to become the basis for that kind of advocacy at some stage, then certainly I, I see a big scope for uh, uh, some kind of social analysis to be a part of those programs and built into those programs so that you know, we influence the larger agenda at the end. Sorry. Thank you very much for that, that, um, that contribution, Nupur. Tim. Uh, 
Thanks a lot. Um, Tim Conway from Diffid. Thanks for three really good presentations. I really enjoyed those. Um, some very thought-provoking um, information. I mean, I think the the idea of expectations came up at a recent IDS conference as well. And you know, just are we in danger of overloading cash transfers and social protection with you know the expectation that it should be socially transformative in all cases? And I think it's possible to see there's there's a continuum of what we can look for and what we can hope for. I mean, I think it's legitimate in some cases to say cash transfers are about addressing immediate material deprivations, particularly in the humanitarian context. But at a very minimum, you should think through what the social consequences are, what the relational consequences are, and you should you know, minimize, you know, try to avoid any harm. You should look for any potential to also leverage positive advantages. And then in maybe more you know, long-term schemes, the social impacts should become a little bit more central. But I think it's legitimate to say there is a, there is a cont uh, continuum, and particularly for humanitarian emergency things, maybe, maybe you shouldn't be too, you shouldn't have too high expectations that you're going to transform gender relations, transform state society relations. Um, and then beyond that, I was just going to say that I think, I can't remember who asked if there was any quantitative evidence um, of the impact of cash transfers on social relations, and I, only know of one, and that was by the IFS, Institute of Fiscal Studies, and I can't remember the name of the author. He used a rather complex, well, it was an impact evaluation, and then he used sort of social psychology techniques. He used games to look at the degree of trust amongst recipients and non-recipients within communities, and he concluded um, that, yes, actually it did, Progressor had very positive impacts on the degree of trust, um, which is quite interesting and a little bit at odds with conclusions that you know, um, poverty targeting can can also be divisive, but you can you can look up that IFS um, and you should find it eventually. But that's an interesting one. Um, the only other thing I was going to say is there is somebody highlighted the interesting point about the fact that Kenya seems to have some positive effects on expectations from local service government service providers, even though um, you know the cert the transfers are actually being provided with not much involvement of government. Um, and I think this relates a little bit to the challenge to donors about how we finance this in low-income countries. And there's some interesting thinking now about using cash transfers as one sector, if you like, um, in which to try out cash on delivery aid. This idea that you say to the government, okay, we will pay you when you can prove you've delivered something. Um, this seems, I mean, certainly the, the Nancy Birdsell Centre for Global Development line on this is this is a way to square, you know, the, the Western taxpaying pay public's desire for measurable outcomes, fewer child deaths or the rest, with the fact that, you know, most people who take a long-term view say you've got to transform the state, you've got to build state society relations or the rest. And, you know, the view is this might be a way to square that circle. You say, okay, we will pay you you know, 20 million when you can prove that you are getting cash transfers to 15,000 people every month and you've done it for six months. Um, so that might be one way that donors can stump up the money, but you can still actually contribute to building a state society relationship. And it's very early thinking, but I think it's, it's quite interesting. Thank you very much for that, Tim. Um, we've just got a little while left, so may I ask uh, the next two questioners to just pose their questions or comments quite briefly. Ian, you first. Uh, Ian McCorson from Oxford Policy Management. Uh, I think, Tim, the IFS researcher was Orazio Atanasio. Um, yeah. Uh, we've, yeah, I really enjoyed all the presentations and we've been involved in evaluations of um, programs mentioned in each of them, in fact. And we've been reflecting on similar lines to you and it's fantastic to hear your, your papers. Um, I think our reflections have taken us down two um, roads, which I'll just set out really briefly. One is to emphasize that a cash transfer, like any program, is not only about the transfer of cash to individuals, but every single other part of that process has an impact. And I think I'd really echo all these thoughts about thinking about the consequences of the type of payment process that is set up, the way that the recipients are selected, uh, how the monitoring and evaluation is done, even how the program is introduced to communities all have quite significant social and political impacts. And the second line that we've taken, is, and we set both of these out in a recent paper presented at the conference Tim was mentioning at IDS, 
is that there are already frameworks in place to analyze these different types of impact, mm. one of which came from the University of Bath, which is a, a way of looking at well-being, which um, posits that you can have three dimensions of, of well-being. One is material, and that's all the usual types of evaluative things we look at, impacts on income, education, health, and so on. But others are relational, the way in which we relate to other people. And a third is symbolic, the types of values and power structures and institutions um, that may be strengthened or weakened um, by the process of cash transfers. Uh, and I would think that there are, there are good ways out there of, of uh, posing these issues. Thank you very much. And the lady at the front. Hello, I'm Astrid walker born I'm the Head of Policy at HelpAge International. There's a couple of comments, really. One relating to Rachel's questions is about to, are we expecting too much and are we making a truth about social justice and transformation? And for me, that's not really the case. For me, the issue is actually, where do we look for evidence? And my sense is that we're looking for these, we have these high expectations, but we're actually looking at a lot of poverty target, small scale programs. We're actually not looking, or maybe you're not looking enough, or I simply don't know about it, at the existing universal categorical programs that exist in large parts of the world, not just in Latin America. In, in South Africa, a pension has been in place for a long, long time, and it has actually been enlarged um, after apartheid, I think for very savvy political reason, namely to actually deal with social unrest and social injustice. So I'm just challenging maybe you as researcher to look to programs to find transformative impacts that aren't short-term MISH or even HSNP type programs, but to look for those that already exist. So it's a question for me where to look. And the second is I, th I fully, agree with the point and the question raised about Sierra Leone, how comes if with all of the right intentions it did so disastrously bad? And I think the good thing is that the Sierra Leonean government officials completely recognised that they did a really bad job. Mm -hmm. They know they rushed it for a whole number of reasons, they didn't really have the skill set, they didn't really know what they were doing, they were just trying to make a point and they want to do it better. And that's a really, really good starting point. And for me, the key lessons in the work we do in emergencies or elsewhere is to think before we start to act. For example, when it comes to um, Southern Sudan, for example, we're going to undertake a study with Save the Children and hope that with DFID support to actually look at the feasibility of, of cash transfers, food assistance in this post-conflict um, new independent state. And I think the core thing is not to just rush in and do something for the sake of doing something, but to really look at all those aspects and look at the disastrous situation in Southern Sudan, which is comparable to Sierra Leone in terms of infrastructure and not to over -expand. So I think that commitment of the government and us as donors and, and, and agencies who can implement to actually sit back, slow down and learn from the existing lessons is absolutely critical. And I've got no doubt that both in Sudan and Sierra Leone, the next stages will actually be able to deliver on transformation and social justice if we don't rush in and do a crap job, basically. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. It's nice to end with a challenge. Eh? Mm -hmm. um, we had one more question which has come in online from Frank, but I'm going to send Frank my apologies by, um, via the streaming because I think we haven't got time to address that. It related to the impact of the diaspora um, in Sierra Leone. Um, but perhaps that's something Frank might want to take up directly with, with Wally. Um, I'd like now to just give each of the panelists one minute to respond to the second round of observations and comments and to raise any issues which they would like to leave as a gift for the, um, for the audience on those matters. Um, Wally, would you go first again? Um, yeah, Thank okay. Um, I mean, I, I really appreciate Tim's comments, you know, that in terms of expectations, you know, looking at it in the emergency context and the you know, context of long-term development. And I completely agree that for long-term development, we should be looking at wider social impacts, you know, rather than you know looking at you know poverty reduction, economic impacts, and, and so on. And um, Ian, um, yeah, I was at the at the presentation at the IDS, and I, I, I find that framework, you know, looking at well-being, quite useful, particularly the re relational bit, because that's where this research, you know, um, sits with that. And um, Astrid, um, you know, there's really not much to say. You you you've actually said it all. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Holly. Gabby. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say, yeah, um, great comments. Um, I, I, I agree with all of them. Um, I mean, the challenge will be going ahead and sort of 
integrating the sort of recommendations that we've had from our papers and, and the issues that have been raised in, into our in, into our programs going forward. But um, the point that Tim raised, you know, having a sort of continuum approach um, where, you know, maybe in some circumstances an approach to basic needs alone is okay, but that where possible we should be looking to um, achieve the positives and at least at the very minimum uh, analyze that we're doing no harm. Um, I think for emergency programming, that's that's absolutely vital, and it isn't something that we do enough. We just assume that um, you know that we're doing the right thing, and that there's going to be no unintended negatives. And, and actually, I think this research and what you said, Ian, as well, proves that that's not necessarily the case. Everything has an impact, intended or otherwise, and it's something we should bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't really have um, much to add. Um, just quickly to respond to the second part of Carl's question, which I didn't respond to. Um, I think. Um, the FAO and UNICEF jointly, um, with funded by DFID, are looking into the question of um, social networks um, and the impact of cash transfers um, in several countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So hopefully, even if that question isn't really answered in the literature at the moment, then it will do in a few years' time. Um, and just basically to support, um, I, I agree with the comments that were, were made um, just now, and think. Uh, yeah, I think the the key things about um, not overloading the agenda and expecting too much from from cash transfers and the, the important point about every aspect of, of the process of cash transfers is important in the, in the social impact. Okay, well, thank you very much to our three presenters and um, to the person digging up the road outside. Thank you very much to you all for coming here. I think it's been a very rich discussion and I can see it's actually provoked quite a lot of thinking and I think we haven't resolved a lot of the questions that have been posed but I think even raising them is a really useful contribution because in fact there are many unanswered questions, questions of definition, questions of measurement, questions of expectation which really still need to be explored in relation to this area. So thank you very much. Um, you'll find on the shelf outside a number of reports. There's the Concern and Oxfam report which was um, presented today. The Help Age report, which was also presented, and also a number of papers relating to different aspects of cash transfer programming, um, which relate to o work that ODI has been doing over the last couple of years, because there's quite a strong linkage between our own program of research and these questions. So thank you for coming. We hope to see you again at the next event. And I'm afraid may I ask you to vacate the room quite rapidly, um, because it's going to be used for another event in, in, um, in 10 minutes' time. So we need to have time to rearrange the chairs. So thank you all very much.